What is melody, anyway? Richard, uh, you kind of messed my mind up just by asking me to do this interview with that as a title, because <laughs> I kind of thought that that had been an important word in my vocabulary for my entire career, and I've always thought of myself as thinking that melody and being melodic was very important. But until you came along with your strange ideas, no one had ever actually ask me that in the form of a question. And I've been trying to think about different ways how I think about it and whatever, but I don't think it's really much different from this cliché deal that we talk about all the time about what is jazz. You know, I, I don't think anybody can answer that very well, or what is swing. Those, some, some of those things are so magical so that we all know it when you hear a great melody but if we had to pick apart each one of those notes individually to say what it was that was great about them, I think we'd pretty much be stumbling and fumbling. At least I know I would be. Um, this morning, knowing that I was going to be meeting you and that you were going to be sticking that mic in my face, <laughs> um, I thought about talking, that melody in music is a way of having a conversation, and that possibly some aspect of a great melody would be similar to putting words together the way an eloquent person would be speaking, either romantically or on whatever subject, that there are some people who speak better than others. And being a pianist who tries to play melodies on a percussion instrument in which there's no voice involved, I know that I'm always trying to make up for that by being conscious of my breathing and trying to make the piano sing or to conquer the fact that the piano doesn't really sing, it, it plunks. Uh, and so I think of melody as a vocal thing, as a breathing thing, as a human thing that gets to raw emotions of people. And perhaps there is some element of that pattern of the way the notes go up and down at whatever the rhythms are in a great melody that relates to talking and communicating in that way. Well, let me ask this question then. You said the notes going up and down, which of course makes me think about, you know, one of your most well-known tunes, the, t the taxi theme. Why do you think that was so appealing? Why do you think people love that tune so much? Well, here you get at the humbling uh, place where you have to admit, I mean, I guess I wouldn't have to admit, I, I probably could hide it and, and pretend that I didn't know how random that it was uh, and not admit that, but in this particular case, my most recognizable, most familiar melody that I've ever composed and been involved with pretty much came about by accident. I had been asked to write a theme for a TV show, knowing that if the TV show was successful, my theme would be heard by many millions of people. So I was aware of the import of that. So I wrote a piece that I thought was appropriate, melodically, and they ended up choosing something else and after that because the Angela theme was actually composed as a bit of incidental music for one of the episodes originally and when I did what I thought was going to be my main theme uh, it was on a recording session where I recorded eight other tunes and this one tune which was a throwaway almost for me it was I was envisioning it as uh, some music that Judd Hirsch as, as he was walking down the hallway to an apartment of this girl that he was having a blind date with for the first time and thinking about the fact that he was going to have to find out what she looked like for the first time having talked to her on the telephone many many times so it was kind of a bittersweet little um, moment silence and uh, I wrote this short little thematic piece and that was all I thought about it and a week later after the producers heard it they thought it fit the mood of what they were trying to do for the opening, which I hadn't even seen. There was the whole opening of Taxi, where the taxi's coming across the bridge at dusk, and it's very mellow and everything. I hadn't even seen that. So in my mind, the mood 
should have been the frenetic pace of New York City and cab drivers and the crowdedness and the honking horns yeah. and all of that. The way, but that was not what they wanted for the series at all. And of course, when they told me, uh, who am I to argue with them uh, liking it? However, they liked it, so they picked that. And now, 25 years later, it's still associated with me in many ways as the most melodic, uh, recognizable theme that I've done. Now, now jumping ahead to the present time, I had this other very peculiar thing happen in which I discovered that there was something else that I didn't know about this melody, which is that it's apparently quite Chinese in character. And that was totally unplanned, uh, given that I was trying to write a New York-sounding theme. And it turns out that the first 12 notes of this theme are in the Chinese modal minor pentatonic scale with no extra notes in there. It's just, uh, it could have been written for the uh, Shanghai Taxi series just as <laughs> easily. And that was pointed out to me by my young Chinese musician friends with whom I've been working on this project, Angels of Shanghai. Did you try to have the melody played on the koto? <laughs> Well, uh, I, ha I actually did have it played on the erhu, uh, okay. which is the Chinese two-string violin uh, instrument, and it sounds great on this instrument, and I've had a wonderful time going back and forth. The, the version that I did of this theme on the Angels of Shanghai project is definitely an east-west mm -hmm. kind of thing with no attempt at car horns or... Uh, anything like that. You also started out as an arranger for CTI, doing uh, arrangements, and your actual arrangements of all your albums are quite specific. I mean, you have, you break up the tunes with different instruments playing different parts of the melodies. How do you make those choices? There's so many variables to that, so I guess it would be hard to answer that in a simple way, because after hundreds and hundreds of different tunes and choosing them, I did spend a lot of my career as an arranger. I loved being an arranger. I love working with different instruments in the orchestra, and I'm sure that's one of the major reasons why I got attracted to doing this new Chinese project, because it gave me an opportunity to learn new instruments that I'd never worked with before and learn how they play melody, how they sound in different registers. So I'm always thinking about that. And maybe it also is because when you're a pianist, having those other colors, having the, the instruments, once again, that breathe when the piano doesn't. So having a flute play the melody or a saxophone play the melody, I know that it's going to have a different kind of character than I would ever be able to play it on the piano. And, and you were one of the first guys to really explore the extremely melodic usage of, of the synthesizer. So when that started out, did you suddenly say, hey, this is going to be fun, I could use this and I could do that? Yes, although I'm, I must say that I've always fought the synthesizer when it comes to playing melodies on them, and rarely ever on my own stuff. I know there are the, the real exponents of that, even amongst the pianists and the Chick Corea and George Duke and a lot of these guys utilize the pitch wheel and the vibrato and all of those functions of uh, synthesizer to take advantage of the yeah. fact that suddenly they had the opportunity to breathe in a way that you couldn't on a mm -hmm. keyboard. But, I, uh, again, I probably shouldn't admit it, but I never felt that I did a very good job at that, and I always tried to shy away from it because I was never comfortable with my left hand over there yeah. going wah, 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 wah. Well, I'm not talking so much about that, but you use, you use the synthesizer a lot as a doubling, like a doubling for the piano or a doubling for the electric piano or a doubling for some other. You, know, it's, you use it as a color rather than the melody itself to add another color to the melody. Absolutely. As an orchestral instrument, I love it. And, and it's like having the power of a thousand-piece orchestra with you all the time. And it's, it's extremely powerful economically, too, because <laughs> as you're sitting there at your arranger's desk, you can at least test, even if I was going to end up having a conventional orchestra with conventional instruments playing the parts, I could test them out first rather than have to wait until I had 30 musicians sitting there in the studio mm -hmm. at great expense and then find out that the sound wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who have been some of your favorite melodists that you've worked with? Oh, boy. I guess I remember now that I knew that you would ask that question. <laughs> there are so many. Of course, I gravitate toward the instruments that breathe, the flute, the saxophone, the trumpet. And in the case of the flute, Hubert Laws was one of my collaborators and friends early on when I was making the recordings at CTI. 
And I can remember with Hubert, when I would know that he was going to be on a session, even if it was my album, I preferred having him play the melody because I like being an accompanist. I like using the piano to play chords, and I'm perfectly happy to have someone of that level interpreting and playing my melodies because I know that they're going to enhance it and they're going to bring their own personality to it and, and make it grow in a way that the piano would not do. And then the same thing with Grover Washington playing the saxophone. It was just natural if I had the power to be able to have those kind of guys in the studio that I would use them specifically to play the melody. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would play the other part. I'd play the comps or the, the little punches in between and possibly uh, take a little solo after they did or something <laughs> like that. Twice, yeah. and, then, and then I would just feel a little bit guilty about the fact that my name was on the cover. <laughs> Well, well uh, but also, of course, I mean, your your actual piano style of playing melodies is quite specific. You have a certain touch. You talked earlier about the idea of thinking about breathing when you're playing a non-breathing instrument like a piano. Can you give, like, an example of that, of, of, of any of your tunes? Definitely major importance to me, and I, I think about it all the time because of the fact that one could, being a pianist, playing that kind of instrument, just continue on and on and on forever with an endless cascade of notes. And I could mention a few pianists that sort of do that that <laughs> are not among my favorites, but I, I, I will stay politically correct and, and oh, uh, keep it just as a generic uh, kind of a comment. But going back far enough into jazz history, I don't think admirers of Art Tatum or Oscar Peterson would be too mad at me if I said that I think those kinds of super virtuosic pianists had to fight extremely hard not to just keep playing because they could. Mm -hmm. and, and it was fun. And the audiences love hearing them uh, be able to play endlessly. My technique didn't allow me to play anywhere near as fast as either one of those guys. <laughs> so I found that I was searching for something else. I was aware of the fact that you could be more melodic in the way that you approach playing the piano if you remembered that you should take a breath every now and then. And uh, I was helped by that. I will never forget a comment that was made very casually to me by Ron Carter during the course of a recording session. And Ron Carter is not usually at a loss for uh, words being candid and saying whatever the hell he thinks that he wants to say. I, I don't remember the literal words, but the gist of it was, leave some space in there occasionally, Bob. You don't, you don't have <laughs> right. to fill up every hole. And, and that was true in the way he was describing it, not only with soloing, but with comping and, and everything else, is that, that allowing the music to breathe was very important. Mm -hmm. And when you get your moment to play a solo, if you're earlier in your career where you're trying to get heard and, and the way it always was in jazz, that the word of mouth would take you to the next level of getting more gigs, the, the instinct was to give it all you had and play every note that you ever learned. And <laughs> invariably, to me, that was a disaster because you always went too far and it was too hyped and, uh, and it, you weren't really making music. So it was much further down the line for me when I learned that I could be more patient and be more effective if I left out a lot of notes and started to learn how to breathe from the piano and play melodies rather than just play all these scales and things that you learned in the practice room. And very often I talk about Count Basie as maybe one of my favorite pianists in that way because he definitely understood that his function as a pianist in that incredible big band was an awful lot of time to just stay out of the way and just pop in with a with a little lick or a little chord every now and then mm. to inject his personality into the music just the right place to give it some spark but if he'd been playing too much it would have just gotten in the way of the yeah. swing got in the way of everything else and so that was a very powerful learning experience for me yeah and and it's like what you said about speech i mean if if he plays and then waits the audience has got to think what's going to happen next i wonder what he's going to do and then suddenly so whip and then, oh, he's developed it. He doesn't have to do much to actually keep the audience engaged, which is, of course, exactly what you do. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually gotten into some dialogues with audiences, and I really like to know whether people are really listening to you and when you play a solo. 
And I found that I can tell much more clearly whether my audience is really listening to me if I take a moment to play nothing than if, than if I play the fastest, most incredible thing that I've ever tried to play, realizing that sometimes that'll just wash right through people's ears and they won't even be paying attention to you. Absolutely. But if I choose the right time where maybe I've played three quarters of a pretty cool melodic phrase and then I don't finish it and mm -hmm. then there's nothing happening at all I can actually physically look around and make eye contact with the audience uh -huh. and get a, this very strong response because they're with me they mm -hmm. were with me on that melody they mm -hmm. were with me on the adventure of finding their way through something that you played mm -hmm. and you tease them by just stopping and and then letting the groove go on for maybe eight bars before you ever play anything and it's really fun because at that moment I know that they're following me melodically they were following mm -hmm. what I played and they got a whether it's they get a laugh out of it or mm -hmm. whether they get frustrated by it come on come on finish that melody yeah. finish it finish yeah. it play that other note yeah. and that's a dialogue that is powerful and really fun to have because you're sharing that whole thing with the audience absolutely while Bob James was at my studio in November 2003, I recorded his band with the fabulous Billy Kilson on drums and the amazing James Genius on bass, playing a tune by saxist Dave McMurray called My Brother and Me. Thank you. 
Radio. 